Hello and welcome to Turf Truth Tuesday where we look at claims in the turf grass industry and ask, are they true? If you're new to the channel you may like to subscribe to be notified of new content. If you have been in the turf grass industry for any length of time, you have likely come across the topic of base saturation. Base saturation has, well, saturated our industry for decades. Today we are looking at some of the history and claims of base saturation, the scientific evidence, and some of the risks associated with using it. Claims about how base cation saturation benefits turf grass abound. But generally, claims center around soil chemical, physical, or biological properties. Let's take a look at a few. Our first video comes from Mark Cooch from the Teva Corporation. Uh, let's talk about, just real quick, about liming, okay? Most everybody's going to lime off the pH of your soil, okay? Not exactly correct, but close enough. And what we do, we don't, I don't base my liming recommendations off of this pH. Okay, you have our attention. I make my liming recommendations off of this base saturation right here. You make your liming recommendation based off the percentage of calcium on the soil exchange site? Our next video comes from Ag PhD. A common claim is base saturation is important to maintain the soil physical properties and drainage. Let's see what you got. We'd like to see that magnesium percentage be somewhere between 12 and 20%. Now, right away you may say, well, that's a big range. What really determines if I want to be on the low end of the range or the high end of the range? And what's going to determine that is what kind of soil type you have. For example, if you've got very sandy soil, one of the challenges you have is holding enough moisture. Well, magnesium is a very small particle. And if we have more magnesium in the soil, it tightens up that soil a little bit and you can hold more water. So we'd like to see that towards the 18 to maybe even 20% range on a lighter soil. If we've got a heavy clay soil, Holding water is not our problem. We may be holding too much, and we like to see that range down towards 12 to 14% on the low end. So, we have soil chemical and physical properties. What about turf grass soils? Let's see what Earthworks has to say. And in this case, what is deficient is calcium. As you can see by the deficiencies here, both samples, left and right, have calcium deficiencies. Remember this part because we will come back to it at the end. So, in this case, the recommendation is using high calcium lime, even though the pH is high. Um, did we hear that right? <laughs> so in this case, the recommendation is using high calcium lime, even though the pH is high. Add lime to lower pH. Add lime to lower pH. Because what we want to accomplish is using that lime to knock off that excessive magnesium, which will actually start to allow hydrogen to come onto that soil colloid Not true. and bring the pH down. Not true. pH is high because of the magnesium. If we can find a way to push that magnesium off by using this high calcium lime, we can actually change that soil. High Calcium limestone is low magnesium limestone. True. By using that limestone will actually drive magnesium off the soil. True. Balance this soil, open it up physically, Not true. provide a better environment for biology, no evidence. and have a better overall soil. Wow. We think he covered all the claims in less than 30 seconds. So, we have claims that balancing soil cations improves water holding capacity, improves drainage, increases biological activity, improves soil chemistry, and a whole host of other claims. The evidence refuting base saturation is overwhelming, which we will discuss in a moment. However, as you can see from just a few clips, numerous companies and consultants continue to use the concept. Even the USGA, which in the past clearly did not condone using base saturation, has as recently as 2020, been duped into believing it. This can be a very dangerous, and expensive road to go down. So, let's back up a little, and take a look at how we got here. Ironically, this whole mess started with a very reputable scientist named Justice von Liebig. Many of you may know him from Liebig's Law of the Minimum, which is still a useful and valid concept used today. One of Liebig's last students was Oscar Lowe, and as far as we can tell, it was Lowe who first suggested the soil should have a balanced calcium to magnesium ratio in the journal Flora in 1892. In 1901, Lowe concluded that calcium to magnesium should be 5 to 4, this despite Lowe's own research indicating that maximum plant growth was achieved across a wide range of calcium to magnesium ratios. In the early 20th century, Numerous studies were conducted to determine if Lowe's hypothesis was correct. These studies indicated Lowe's hypothesis, that the calcium to magnesium ratio should be 5 to 4, was incorrect. Remember, these are only some of the refuting publications between 1901 and 1940, when Baer and Albrecht developed the base saturation ranges. We will pop the citations in the description below. 
Despite this research concluding that plant growth was not influenced by the ratio of calcium to magnesium, in 1945 Dr. Furman Baer organized the calcium to magnesium concept into base saturation ranges. Dr. Baer claimed the exchange complex should be occupied by calcium, magnesium, potassium, and hydrogen, at 65%, 10%, 5%, and 20%. This was despite Dr. Baer himself acknowledging that his research showed maximum growth was achieved across a wide range of cation ratios. Regardless of all the refuting evidence, Dr. William Albrecht was also conducting research in this area in Missouri, and in fact, the existing base saturation recommendations are attributed to Dr. Albrecht. However, many of Dr. Albrecht's experiments were flawed and fraught with a misunderstanding of the results. For example, in his 1938 paper, Dr. Albrecht states, quote, Soils can be too seriously sour for effective nutrition, but defective nutrition on sour soils need not be due wholly to the presence of excessive hydrogen ion concentration. It is more likely due to the deficiency of basic nutrients, cations, among which calcium is the foremost. This assertion was made despite Dr. Albrecht's own data from the same paper indicating he was incorrect. Let's take a look. Here we see Dr. Albrecht's plants growing in soils with pH ranging from 4.0 to 6.5. The top row of plants received 0.5 milli equivalents of calcium per plant, the middle row received 1 and the bottom row received 2. It is clear that soil pH is limiting plant growth, not calcium deficiency as claimed by Dr. Albrecht. Here we see another example of Dr. Albrecht's data showing that soybean nodulation is in fact, limited by low pH and not just calcium deficiency as claimed by Dr. Albrecht. Clearly, Dr. Albrecht did not take into account the influence of pH that we now know plays an important role in the soil and plant relationship. Unfortunately, many of Dr. Albrecht's conclusions are incorrect due to the influence of changes in soil pH that he himself did not recognize. Despite the overwhelming amount of refuting evidence, including evidence from his own research, Dr. Albrecht formed his base saturation hypothesis into the base cation saturation ratio as we know it today. Is there any supporting evidence for the use of base cation saturation in agriculture or turf grass? Commonly, you will hear proponents tell stories like this. I said that uh, uh, we need to balance these soils, and these soils were really, really out of balance, 35% magnesium, 50% calcium, hard as a rock, just terrible. And, um, and so when I sat down, and, and back in the day, we used to use a lot of high calcium lime to try to, to uh, rebalance some of these high magnesium soils and then use a lot of ammonium sul sulfate uh, to try to counter the high pH move from the, from the, the line. When I brought this up, uh, the father said that, uh, well, the soils were high pH. And I said, yeah, but we're going to try to rebalance this and, and we'll use the, the ammonium sulfate to, to counter some of that. And all he could see was, well, it was high pH and I was full of it. We put the high calcium lime on, we came back and we put some gypsum on. And I think maybe a couple years later, we put some more high calcium lime on. About five years later, I'm driving down the road and the father is taking weed off. He jumped out of the combine, motioned me over, and he pointed at me and he said, look at this. He said, five years ago, it would have taken an ax to get in the ground. And he dug his heel in the ground. He says, I'm amazed. We could bore you by showing a dozen more stories like this, but they are not evidence. The plural of anecdote is not data. So, we can take all these stories, anecdotes, and hearsay, put them into a box, put a cute little ribbon on top, and place them into the observation category, which is perhaps, the most important step in the scientific method, but not evidence. Evidence starts in this category. When we consider the scientific evidence, inevitably proponents will pull out work conducted by Dr. Albrecht as we see here. So you asked the base saturation thing or whatever, and so, you know, yeah, there is a quote-unquote Brookside, you know, soil philosophy, yeah, right? Exactly. It's, it's, it's based, on right. work, Albrecht. it's based on work that William Albrecht did. However, we suspect people who use Dr. Albrecht's work have not taken the time to critically review his work. If they did, they might realize they have a major issue to overcome. As we see in this quote from Dr. Albrecht's 1940 publication, he believed that the saturation of the soil with calcium was of greater importance than the amount of calcium applied. This belief permeates through his books and publications. We now know his belief was incorrect. As we see from these data from Ohio State University, yield is not influenced by calcium saturation. The dotted line represents the ideal calcium to magnesium ratio according to the base saturation model. According to Baer and Albrecht, this would be the point at which maximum growth is achieved. If this was true, yield would decline as we move further to the left or right of the dotted line. However, as you can see, this does not occur. Growth remains unaffected by the calcium to magnesium ratio, and this has been confirmed in dozens of publications. 
So, proponents of Dr. Albrecht's work must overcome a mountain of refuting evidence, or simply ignore it. Generally, most people choose the latter. Now look what you've done. You've given him a complex. As we have already shown, Bear and Albrecht's own research refuted their conclusions. So, what about turfgrass? In 2003, a team at Iowa State investigated calcium applications to a low CEC calcareous bentgrass green and concluded that applying calcium had no effect on bentgrass, even when magnesium saturation was greater than recommended by the base saturation method. Base saturation proponents will acknowledge base saturation is not effective on soils with less than 8 CEC. And the, the biggest <laughs> thing was, when I got there, they already had the plot set up, and I said, hey, this uh, this this Albrecht balance is not going to work in exchange capacities of 7 to 8 or below. So, if you are using base saturation on greens with less than 8 CEC, keep in mind even the supporters of base saturation acknowledge it does not work. Of course, we know that base saturation has been shown to be ineffective, even on soils with higher CECs as well. So, the implication that base saturation is effective only on soils with a CEC greater than 8, has also been confirmed to be inaccurate. Back to turfgrass. In 1982, a Florida team investigated calcium to magnesium ratios on a soil with a CEC of 11. They reported that a double acid magnesium concentration of 60 parts per million was sufficient for the growth of Bermuda and ryegrass, and turfgrass growth was not influenced by the calcium to magnesium ratio, which varied from 2.9 to 20.6. In 1993, the same Florida team reported that quote, Bermuda grass and perennial ryegrass will tolerate a wide range in soil calcium to magnesium ratios without exhibiting detrimental effects. In 1986, the claim that base saturation will influence moisture retention and open up soils was investigated by Rengasamy. His team reported that hydraulic conductivity was not influenced by the ratio of calcium to magnesium. Only in cases where the magnesium saturation is unrealistic for field soils, has the magnesium saturation been shown to influence hydraulic conductivity. Even in these cases, it is likely the amount of magnesium, not necessarily the amount relative to calcium, that results in reduction of water movement. Regarding soil biological activity, weeds, and diseases, comparatively less research has been conducted. However, in 2000, Schoenbeck reported that reducing the magnesium saturation had no effect on organic matter, biological activity, weed presence, or disease incidence. In 2021, a team from Ohio State published a six-year study, measuring the influence of base saturation on soil biological, physical, and chemical properties and concluded that managing nutrients according to base saturation, resulted in no influence on any measured parameter including soil structure, water penetration, soil biology, or crop yield. Also in 2021, a team surveyed soil fertility scientists from land-grant institutions in the U.S., and concluded that the scientific consensus is that base saturation is not a legitimate practice. Perhaps the absurdity of base saturation and the amount of wasted money, can be more easily appreciated if we graph it out. In this graph, the green line represents the existing calcium sufficiency level for Ohio soils, above which, no benefit to applied calcium would be expected. The orange and blue lines are the calcium ranges required according to the base saturation model. According to the sufficiency level, the amount of extractable calcium required does not change as the CEC increases. If your CEC is zero, you need 200 parts per million extractable calcium. If your CEC is 30, you still need 200 parts per million extractable calcium. However, if you use base saturation, the amount of calcium you would need, increases as the CEC increases. Of course, this is one reason why many calcium salesmen are proponents of base saturation, because they know a base saturation soil test will frequently indicate the need to apply calcium, even if none is needed. We could go on and on, but we think we have made our point. There is essentially, no valid supporting evidence for base saturation, and we have copious amounts of evidence refuting it. So one might say, who cares? I have been using base saturation for years and my course looks fine. Obviously, one risk associated with using base saturation is the misapplication of nutrients. Let's back up to a previous clip where calcium was claimed to be deficient. And in this case, what is deficient is calcium. As you can see by the deficiencies here, both samples, left and right, have calcium deficiencies. So, Joel asserts that 4,000 pounds of extractable calcium per acre is not enough. Two tons per acre. Just let that sink in. That is almost 100 pounds of extractable calcium per thousand square feet. The exact critical calcium concentration for turfgrasses remains elusive. However, it is likely between 400 and 800 pounds per acre using 1 molar ammonium acetate at pH 7, or between 750 and 1,500 pounds per acre using Malik 3. However, it could be much lower. In any case, the 4,000 pounds of extractable calcium that Joel asserts is not enough, 
is more than two and a half times greater than our current best estimation. This is the absurdity of base saturation. Wasted nutrients, wasted time, and wasted money. Inversely, a second risk is the under-application of nutrients. Even if the cation ratios are within recommended ranges, a nutrient deficiency may still exist. This is common on soils with a low CEC, such as greens or soils high in sand. In other words, although the turf's diet may be balanced, it may not be receiving enough food. Although the first two risks are important, the primary risk associated with using base saturation is the failure to follow evidence. If you subscribe to base saturation, then, at least to some degree, you are convinced that it works. People can be convinced for good reasons or for bad reasons, and in the case of base saturation, we have yet to find good reasons to use it. However, as we have already shown, research has found numerous reasons to not use it. So, if you are using or recommending base saturation, you believe something without evidence. The relationship between belief and evidence was well stated by the Scottish philosopher David Hume. He wrote in his book, An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. A wise man therefore, proportions his belief to the evidence. So, the major risk from our perspective is, if you are willing to use time and money to follow a recommendation that has no supporting evidence, what else might you be willing to follow? The bottom line is that base saturation may indeed be correct. But, until the supporting evidence outweighs the refuting evidence, using base saturation to apply nutrients to turf grass, is not a best management practice. Well, that about does it. Base saturation thoroughly debunked. We thank everyone for watching, and we hope you found the information informative. Don't forget to subscribe if you would like to be notified of new content, and check back next week where we will be addressing an earlier clip in today's video. The president of Earthworks claims that lime will lower pH and is refuted by his own agronomist. Awkward?